Actor Jason Robarbs is the guest on Later with Bob Costas on February 19th, 1992. And the actor, even though he came from a family of actors, ignored the calling to the craft that he obviously was really good at. Um, he was out on a, a, a war boat during World War II and read Eugene O'Neill's strange interlude and it moved him so much that he decided to follow in his family footsteps. And uh, the guy is a great interview and a great actor and just hearing his ethics and his reasons you, you're going to want to watch more of his films. You've seen a bunch of them. I mean, he, he famously is Howard Hughes and Melvin and Howard and uh, he was in All the President's Men and tells a great story about meeting Nixon after the movie. And, and, and the best part of this interview is the discussion about the post-nuclear annihilation society film called The, the, the Day After, which had struggle, a two-year struggle to get aired because no network would, would take the risk for such a long time. And it was controversial. I think it was around 1978 or something like that. But I, I remember there being discussion, can we show this kind of concept of what life would be like after the bomb? Hell yeah. We shall know <laughs> what we might be getting into. We show, show the virus movies too. Show us every. Thanks for staying up later. Jason Robards is here. His credits are too numerous to list, and I'm looking at it this way. If you don't know the credits, you're turning this off and going to bed a half hour earlier. <laughs> if you know what's good for you, you're sticking with us here uh, yes, as uh, we shoot the breeze a little bit. I'm going to throw uh, this quote at you to start out with. Herb Gardner, who was the playwright for yeah. A Thousand Clowns, said, If you really want to offend Jason, pay him a compliment. Worse still, give him an award. If you were playing softball with him in the park and you praised him for a good catch, then he'd be happy. But don't talk about his acting. I think he's not only embarrassed by acting, I really think he feels degraded. Degraded? That's what Herb Gardner said. Now, I, I don't know where Herb got the idea that, uh, probably because uh, I don't go into a lot of uh, interior stuff too much. Maybe that's what he meant. But, yeah, I think he said yeah. somewhere, look. If you yeah. can make believe, if you're good at that's making what believe, I, that's what you're a I good say. actor, and the hell with the method stuff. I don't do a lot of uh, tremendous research and uh, things. I'm, for instance, I was playing Howard Hughes, and uh, I received some very wonderful compliments by people who were very close to him. I said, how did you know? That's exactly how he was. I said, well, I, what did you do? Did you find, find these things out? I said, well, I'll tell you, my, uh, his middle name was Robard. And his family on his aunt's side was Loomis, which was my grandmother's uh, the maiden name. Uh -huh. So I said, that's all the research I need. I don't, don't <laughs> I mean, Loomis and Rope are the name. I figured, well, uh, why do I need to put a wig on and, uh, and grow your beard and, uh, and you got it? If I asked you to put two or three films in a time capsule that you've been in, what would you select? Um, all the President's Men... Uh, Cable Hog, Ballad of Cable Hog, a thing I did with Peck and Paw. And, uh, geez, I can't remember all of them. Well, with all the President's Men, yeah. you pick up the Oscar for your portrayal of Ben Bradley yeah. of the Washington Post. And subsequently. A Thousand Clowns is a good film. Uh -huh. I like that. Well, go ahead with that. But subsequently, Bradley said he knew in an instant that you had gotten him, that somehow you'd had him nailed, and it was some physical thing where you were pounded on a desk that made Bradley believe. Oh, it was when I walked away and hit, did something like that. Uh, that was strange. I didn't know that uh, he did that. Uh, Alan Pakula was directing, said we did the take about eight times. Said, now, after you finish that uh, speech to the boys, leave the, uh, I'm going to do a shot. Uh, you leave and you walk down the entire uh, uh, Washington Post room, you know, the uh, editorial room there, and it's a long walk down the elevators. Do something, he said, as you go. So I did it. We did eight takes. I did, did a different thing. And one of them I did. <laughs> and they put that in. 
speaking of all the president's men, way before Watergate, before he was ever president, when he was Eisenhower's vice president, you had a run-in with Nixon, didn't you? Not really a run-in. We were all... An encounter. An encounter. We were at Frankie and Johnny's uh, restaurant in New York uh, in those days. Johnny was still there then. It's not the same anymore, but it was fun then. And uh, James Mitchell, who was Secretary of the Treasury, it was the brother of Thomas Mitchell, who was a very famous actor. And Tommy was in a play in New York at the time, and a lot of actors hung out in this place. Well, a lot of sports, a lot of sports people there, and uh, also the, uh, a lot of Tammany guys. Mm -hmm. It was a great old place to be in. And uh, so we, um, I was in there, and Tommy Mitchell said, this is my brother, and uh, Jim Mitchell and uh, his friend here, and it was Milhouse, it was Nixon. <laughs> Johnny says to me, take your hat off, will you? The vice president's in here. I said, I'm going to take my hat off. You know, you get with this. Uh, right. I'm not going to take my hat. And he didn't take his hat off. He had an overcoat on. So we started talking about football and uh, Yorba Linda and uh, uh, Whittier. And uh, I don't know. We didn't. It was an encounter in a way. I, I was just kidding him about being a lousy football player and this and that and the other thing. And uh, then I, and I also saying uh, about his politics. I didn't like what he'd done with Helen Hagen Douglas and uh, Jerry Voorhees out there because I remembered it very right, well. Early in his all, career in California. Uh, in California, writing out those bum letters, and he started laughing. And all they had his drink, and they went to went into the other room and uh, had their dinner. Johnny says to me, God, you are terrible. I mean, you insulted him. You did every. I mean, how dare you bring that up? You're barred, he said from here. You're barred. I'm barring you for a week. You can't come in. For a week? Yeah. <laughs> no drink. Well, what a tough disciplinarian. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he said, you were terribly insulting by those things. I thought I was uh, here. Everybody's applauding me when I was telling him about Jeff Voorhees and all that stuff. See, Nixon just and came Nixon to get maybe, up. maybe a rack of lamb, and he's being skewered himself. <laughs> yeah, yes, he wouldn't take his hat off either. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, Johnny calls me up uh, about three days later. He said, uh, Nixon called up here, and he wants, he wants us where you are. He'd like to meet you again and have, uh, have some drinks with you. He, he, he got a kick out of it. So he took it in good cheer. Yeah. That speaks well of and him. I, I, I like that. I thought it was funny. I didn't see him again. I think he wanted to know how he could get elected. <laughs> he wanted me to give him some advice. No, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a Republican. Oh, I, I took that yes. for a fact. <laughs> I imagine people approach you with not wariness, but almost reverence. You know, you hear people refer to Jason Robards as perhaps the greatest living American stage actor. And, and your name is grouped with the legendary names of, of the theater. And there's a certain stature. And that stature remains as I sit here and talk to you. But there's no, there's no barrier. There's no, no I th nothing in the way you carry yourself sustains that barrier. No, I probably should get a, a big turned up coat and a black hat. <laughs> 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 I saw Frederick March standing out on Broadway. I said, what are you doing out there in that black hat and a big coat? He said, I'm trying to get somebody to ask me for an autograph. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "You ought to do." It. I said, "No, Freddie. I, don't. <laughs> I I just like to do the work and and go home." I saw you recently and park your car in Harvard yeah. Yard, and you are in virtually every scene. It's just you and and Judith Ivy. Um, in fact, you're in everyone. Yeah, we're never off. You, you're so you're never off, and this requires a lot of energy. And you're pushing seventy years of age. That's right. Yeah, seventy this year coming up. Going to have a big New Orleans party or something. <laughs> Do you ever feel that energy waning? Are you ever up there saying to yourself, just a little more, half an hour, we're done? It's never during the play that you say, oh, uh, it's before sometimes, you know, like the other night. Judy and I both said, well, we had a day off. I don't think we can get through this. Thing. Boom, the play, the minute the thing went, the play took off. You know, the, we went, took right off, and it was a very tight, good performance. Your feeling is, when it's time for an epitaph, you're a stage actor, right? That's right. And um, the theater has, has always been my first love, and I always go back to it. You know, sometimes uh, in the middle of, uh, of, of doing something, Jane Fonda said to me, we'd finished uh, she, uh, Julia, and then we're going on to something else. She said, you know, this, uh, you really go now, except if you're going to go back and do that bloody O'Neill, you, you should not do that. You should go on with 
you're really coming at a time. You're coming through now at a time you could really go through. But I had I had to do that play. I mean, uh, that touch of the poet I did. I loved it. I mean, uh, so if I'm given the chance to have the freedom by by doing both or three, all three media really, uh, uh, then I, I I work to so I can go back on the stage again. O'Neill is pretty much at the heart of your professional existence. Wasn't it a Eugene O'Neill play that you almost stumbled across in uh, the library of a ship you were That's uh, right. stationed yes. aboard in World War II that exactly. first sparked the uh, exactly. interest in I acting? Ran. I thought I was getting a book that was going to be spicy. It was called Strange Interlude. I thought, well, now this is going to be something. And it wasn't. It was a play. But it's fascinating because in that play, it's when he uses the device of we're talking, but the what we're really thinking uh, we don't say. Mm -hmm. So what he had the people do was uh, have dialogue going, and then they'd stop, and then one person would say what he really thought, and then the other person would do that, and then they'd go back to the dialogue. It was that uh, stream of consciousness underneath what was really what was going on up front. And in a way, it's a mask, you know, like, and that's what fascinated me. Read that. Some people might say, why wasn't that interest there all along? Because after all, your dad is Jason Robards Sr., and he was a much acclaimed actor of the age, straddling the period between silent films and talkies. Yeah, but you see, what happened with me was that the first few years of my life, uh, I was, uh, uh, he was on the, in the theater, and I was on the road, I was born on the road. I was born during a play called Lightning in Chicago that he was touring with. And he was doing very well. Then we went out to the coast, uh, Hollywood, uh, when I was five years old uh, in the 20s, and he was doing silence and doing, but, and he made it, he had a wonderful voice, so he got over into talkies, mm -hmm. all right. But he was deteriorating, something was happening, and he was deteriorating, and I didn't know what as a kid, I just saw him going downhill. By the time I was eight or nine years old, uh, it was flat broke, we, we were, Nothing was happening, and uh, I saw him disintegrating my father, who was my best friend, by the way. I saw him disintegrating, and I said, anything that, any profession that does that to somebody, I don't want to be in it. I, I uh, now, what, I'm sure he had his own problems, and his, uh, you know, many things, too, uh, but uh, that I can't judge. I, I don't judge him on it. And what, what, what were his ghosts and things that were eating him up. But it, it happened, and therefore I just didn't want anything to do with it. And uh, I didn't go to do plays in school or anything. I, I just, but somewhere, by osmosis or being around it, I, I would, we told a lot of theater stories, a lot of film stories. You could, we would talk at dinner or something. Mm -hmm. I'm sure something got in there that stuck that I eventually want, wanted to uh, uh, go on a stage. Was he around long enough to witness oh, yeah. some of your great successes? <clears throat> he was, and uh, he, uh, there's a very interesting story. Uh, he had uh, cataracts, and he would not have them removed. He was a Christian scientist, and he said he, would not have them, he would never been to a doctor. Mm -hmm. Another of these guys, I'll never go to a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> but he also was very, used science for what reasons are up to him. And uh, finally, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah. For, finally, uh, he, uh, my mother wrote, uh, said, your father is going to UCLA to have his cataracts removed since I, I had just opened in a long day's journey. I think it in some way forced him to say, I must see that. Mm -hmm. I must see again, because I had done everything in my power to get him to have it done much earlier. I'd gone on tour, and gone out there so I could be with him to try to get him. No. Then this happened, and he uh, this, this big success of the Iceman first in long day's journey, and he came back. He got him fixed and came back to, he got his cataracts taken off, came back to New York and saw me in the play. 
and he had not seen for many years, and he, he said it was so overwhelming. The color was one of the things that struck him. Color. The second one was that he couldn't take it all in at once, and he said, would you ask Freddie March if I could come again tomorrow night and sit in the wings and listen? Because he was so used to listening that that was the, truer to him than seeing. Yeah. And I never forget that, that, that sitting. I could see him in the wings. He said, listen, he's going to find out all the, all the phony things I'm doing. <laughs> Were you surprised, or could you see it coming, the, uh, the national uh, storm of reaction after the TV movie The Day After? where you played this Kansas doctor and uh, you know, the nuclear bomb hits in the Midwest. What I was surprised was we couldn't get it on the air for so long. You know, we made that, and then it was almost a year and a half later before it went on, because nobody would sponsor it. And I didn't know if ABC, who was the network it was on, was going to, whether they were going to just put it on sustaining which I think eventually they did. They might have had one commercial or something, but it was almost a sustaining show. It was interesting. This drew critical fire from both directions. The left thought that it didn't show the devastation of a potential nuclear war graphically enough. The right thought it was so alarmist that it would cause calls for disarmament and we'd become militarily too weak. And I recall reading furious oh, yeah, really? criticism from both sides. Really, you see, I, I, just, I wasn't even in the country when it came out. Isn't that funny? I, I, and I heard about it, you know. Uh, yeah. Because of my, my kids were in school, and uh, they, had, they had to report on it, see it. And my wife wrote, you know, we talked on the phone. She said, yes, they, they had to do all this. And I didn't, uh, I, I knew it caused, I didn't, I didn't read the editorials or know that, that much about it, really. It's funny when you get up and you're on another project and you're somewhere away and you're not in the yeah. country. It's very funny that way. You go places and you don't even don't know what's going on here. And in a strange way, you don't miss it after a while. Except when the Mets won in '69. I, I was in. Where were you? I, I was in Dubrovnik uh, working on a film and uh, I couldn't get any news. I couldn't even get it on the radio. All right, let me fill you in. The Cubs were way ahead. It was like August. They were up yeah, by like nine. I know the that. Mets came out of nowhere. A black cat ran on the field at Shea Stadium on really? a Friday night, went right past Glenn Beckert in the on-deck circle. Nothing went right after that for the Cubs. <laughs> Mets went right past them. They swept Atlanta in three despite Hank Aaron, and then they took Baltimore in five. Tommy Agee made a couple of good five. catches. Don Clendenin hit three home runs. Jerry Kuzman won a couple of games. Well, this is fascinating to you folks, isn't it? Yeah. Pretty much it's been common knowledge <laughs> for 23 know. years, but here we are. <laughs> I remember the Giants in the... Uh, uh, 51. So. When Thompson hit the homer? Yeah. Where were you? I was at the St. Frere Bar on 6th Avenue and 11th Street. I'd been to the A&P shopping and I said, God, they must be in the ninth. My wife sent me out to shop. I had to be too big. I'm going to stick my head in and see what's happening. And I heard uh, a commercial with a it was Ernie Harwell or somebody was on going, Chesterfield, one, two, three, four. That was the Chesterfield, one, two, three, four. And I started yelling in the, one, two, three, four, home run, home. Uh, you know, I was yelling about for that. Never, because of one, two, three, four is four bases. Uh-huh. And uh, then the inning started. There was no home run or anything. But, uh, and I, it was a Brooklyn, the guy that owned the bars from Brooklyn. And, uh. He and the five brothers were from Brooklyn, but we, it, was a, it was in Manhattan. It was a, a uh -huh. lot of giant fans in there. Well, when everything started going and when Thompson hit it, he threw every bar stool out in the middle of uh, Sixth Avenue and said, the bar is yours. And he went home to Brooklyn and left the bar with us, all a bunch of <laughs> Pretty much people. forfeited his life, <laughs> life because there was no cause to keep on living. I cannot believe traffic stopped. There was, <laughs> everything was... My father, I called him up. He, he ran into a tree on the West Coast. He wrote, drove off the road. He was listening to it on the radio in his car. Really? That was, a, that was the shot heard around the world, I'll tell you. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. Uh, I, uh, it was unbelievable to me. And especially I was yelling one, two, three, four people saying, shut up, will you? <laughs> shut up. They didn't want me to yell that. And you were a Giant fan. Oh, yeah, I'll say. If I say Willie Mays, yep. <laughs> what does it make you think of? Greatest style, uh, walking on a field 
my daughter turned to me and she said, now I see why. Just the way he walks and the way he wears his clothes and the way he stands, look at him. Little girl, she said, there. And uh, I mean, not even batting or doing it, just walking on the field. You know, it's just too bad that you haven't lived an interesting life, so we really had to stretch things to get a half hour out of you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Jason Robles, yeah, see you later. You.